I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that tonight will be a time of total release for everyone in the mighty name of Jesus. The presence of the Lord be with every one of us. And the glory of God shine in every life. And the armor of God will be effective in our lives. A good, good amen. Father, we thank you for our workers training tonight. We bless your name for our people, our children, our youths, our youth leaders, our campus leaders, and our coordinators, pastors, uh, sisters, and brothers. We pray that you bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that your word will energize us and empower us. We'll never be the same again. And the armor of God will be effective in every heart, every life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Use us as channels of blessings for people around. We pray that you'll perfect your work in everyone. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're looking at it from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6 reading from verse 10 it says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might then he tells us in verse 11 and he says as we're strong in the Lord and we put on the armor of the Lord he says put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand and to withstand the wiles of the devil. It says in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It says, Wherefore, in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14 tells us, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and in verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18 tells us to keep on praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins. We're going to join verses 19 and 20. In verse 19, it says, and for me, that means pray for me as well. Paul the apostle said that utterance may be given unto me. And that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that wherein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Those are the verses we are considering tonight. And you know, he's talking about God's armor. God's armor for God's army. Of consecrated saints the saints of God those are the brethren because it says be strong my brethren is talking to the children of God and these children of God are those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb they have repented of their sins they have turned away from their evil and they come to the Lord in full repentance and total faith and reliance on the Lord so they become members of the family of God not only that they become members or soldiers in the army of God they are saints they are consecrated they are committed they have a work to do they have a fight to fight and they have a field to possess and they have souls they ought to win unto the Lord and because of that 
They need the armor of God. You couldn't fight, fight the battle with your bare hand. You couldn't fight the battle with carnal weapons. You need the armor of God and the whole armor of God. That's, what, that's why it says we should take on, we should put on, and we should wear every time the whole armor of God as an army of consecrated saints. Tonight, we're looking at the message, God's armor for his army of consecrated saints. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the wonder of our privilege in heavenly places. Underline those words, heavenly places. Number two, the weapon against principalities in high places. Number one, heavenly places. Number two, high places. Number three now is our willingness to preach in hard places. Number three, hard places. Heavenly places, high places, and hard places. Number one, the wonder of our privilege in the heavenly places. Let's come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Six, and we're looking at verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. You have to be in the Lord through salvation, through conversion. You are a member of the body of Christ, and now you are in the Lord. You are not going in and coming out. You abide and you remain in the Lord. You are strong then as you remain in the Lord and in the power of his might. We get his power, we get his might when we are saved and sanctified and filled, baptized, saturated, enveloped by the Holy Ghost. In that Holy Ghost, there is power. In that Holy Ghost, there is might. And it says, as we are in Christ, as well as in the Spirit, we live by the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit, we believe in the Spirit, and we remain in the strength, in the power, in the divine energy of the Spirit. That's how you remain strong. That's how you remain in the power and in the might of the Spirit of God. Look at the heavenly places I pointed out in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Look at those words again. In heavenly places in Christ. That's why we come. That's where we are. That's where we abide. Where we belong to Christ. That we reside and we abide and we continue in heavenly places in Christ. It tells us in chapter 2 of Ephesians verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 6, it says, He has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Holding on to your place, abiding in your place, standing in your place, and staying and abiding with Christ in the heavenly places. Now you can tell us we need to be strong. Why are we strong? And we are, why are we supposed to be strong? Well, because the enemy that is fighting us is not weak. Because the world that is waging war against us is not weak. Because the demons and the messengers of Satan that, fight, that are fighting against our progress, those cohorts of the enemy, they are not weak. And because also the temptation that confronts us, the trial that confronts us, and all the things we go through in life as we're on the field of evangelism, on the field of ministry, because they are not weak, if they are strong and you are weak, you cannot overcome. If they are strong and you are only as strong as they are, you cannot really guarantee your victory. But it is when you are stronger than the enemy, 
you are stronger than the world, you are stronger than the tempters, you are stronger than all the things that wage war against your life. That's the only time you can be strong and you can win the battle. That's the reason why you need them to look at your situation, look at your temptations. Are you stronger than your tempter? Look at your situation. Are you stronger than the situations and circumstances around you? That's the reason why you ought to pray to the Lord tonight and say, Lord, I see my challenges. I see my situation. I see my trial. I see my temptation. I see my condition. And if I'm going to be a winner, if I'm going to overcome, it's not only that I put on the armor. I must be stronger than the challenges that face me. And let's look at how the Bible tells us over and over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And it says, be strong. And it gives us the reason why we are to be strong. And let's look at number one, be strong and courageous. In fact, it says, it's not even enough to be courageous, just to be courageous alone be strong and very courageous. We're looking at Joshua chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 5. In Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 5, It was to overcome the Canaanites, the enemies that would try to debar him and debar them and debar the whole assembly of the children of God and debar the whole congregation of militant saints and soldiers, debar them from getting to the promised land. That's the reason why he called upon Joshua and he called upon everyone in the army of the people of Israel. Be strong. He says in verse 5, there shall not, there shall not end any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. Mark that in your Bible. All the days of your life. You know, it's not that we are down today, we are up tomorrow. It's not that in our straight course, in our winning the battle, you know, sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down and sometimes I'm alive and sometimes I'm weak and sometimes I'm strong and sometimes I'm confident, but other times I'm not confident. All the days of your life, I pray there'll be no moment in your life and there'll be no area of your life when you will not be strong strong in Jesus name it says there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses so I will be with thee I will not fail thee you lost an amen there I will not fail thee nor forsake thee look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says be strong and of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance in the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And then in verse 7, in verse 7, he continues, it says, Only be thou strong and very courageous. You're going to be a pastor. Only be thou strong and be very courageous. You're going to be a woman leader. And you're going to lead all those women into salvation, into Christian experience says only be thou strong and very courageous and you're going to lead the youth in all their restlessness you want to lead them into into redemption and into all that god has for them academic work spiritual work and making heaven at last you have to be strong if you are not strong those children are strong those young people are strong it says if you're going to be a leader a competent leader a courageous leader a conquering leader and you're going to be the person that leads them to everything the Lord has provided for them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Uh, to turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper. I will prosper. That thou mayest prosper. I said I will prosper. As a pastor I will prosper. As a father, I will prosper. As a mother, you will prosper. As a professional, you will prosper. In everything the Lord has called you to do, you will prosper. I see prosperous people in front of me. It will be confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. But 
If you're always holding it and it's too hot, I drop it. If you're always moving forward and it's too high, I go down. If you're always confronting situations and problems and then it's too much for me, I cannot move on. If you're up and down, if you go and then you go back, if you progress and you retrogress, there's no way you can be strong that way and there's no way you can be an achiever that way. But when you say, whatever comes, I'm stronger than the devil. Whatever comes, I'm stronger than the enemy. Whatever comes, I'm stronger than my challenges. Whatever comes, I'm stronger than my persecution. And you're not crying for your persecutors. You are strong. Strong people who are courageous don't cry in front of their enemy, in front of their tempters. I am strong. Let the weak say, it says, only in that way shall thou prosper whereas, wherever thou goest. And then in verse 8, it tells us the secret of that strength. It says in verse 8, it says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt have, thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shall have good success look at verse 9 in verse 9 have not i commanded thee be strong and of a good courage be not afraid anybody afraid there be not afraid i said anybody afraid there it says be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whithersoever thou goest underline that whithersoever thou goest any stage any region any local government any community whatever story i've heard about that a community and whatever may be taking place in those communities whithersoever thou goest the Lord will be with you. Number one, be strong and courageous. Number two, be strong for the commission. Be strong for the commission. We have a commission. The Lord has given us a commission. And Solomon had a commission. If you look at First Chronicles chapter 22, reading from verse 12. First Chronicles chapter 22, reading from verse 12. There it says, Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. And then in verse 13, in verse 13 here is the commission that he had and then shall thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and the judgments which the Lord charged thee, charged Moses with concerning Israel be strong and of a good courage, dread not nor be dismayed. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Look at verse 19 in verse 19 it says now set your heart now set your heart like you set your time. Now set your heart like you set the alarm clock. Now set your heart and, and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God. That was the commission the Lord has given him. The Lord has given us a commission to evangelize the world and to edify the church and to build up families and to build up the servants of God and to build up the people that he has given us to lead and to challenge and to build up. Solomon had his own commission. You have his own, your own commission. And for the commission to be fulfilled, the only way you can fulfill that commission is to be strong and very courageous and then to bring in the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. The Lord will equip you. Number three, be strong to honestly contend and conquer. Be strong to honestly contend and conquer. Even though every member of Deeper Life, every worker in Deeper Life, every pastor in Deeper Life, we know to honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. But 
only few people are contending. Only, only few people are standing up to the faith. God has given us to defend. God has given us to promote. And God has given us to spread everywhere. And if we're going to earnestly contend and conquer, you must be strong. A weak mind cannot contend for the faith. A weak brain cannot contend for the faith. A weak personality cannot contend for the faith. A person that is always looking at the faces of people, I fear the woman, I fear the man, I fear the boy, I fear the girl, I fear the young, I fear the old, I fear those who are my friends, I fear those who are my enemies, I fear society, I fear church, I fear everybody. Are you going to contain? If you are going to contain, honestly contend for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, you will be up and doing. You will know that faith. You will believe that faith. You will understand that faith. And you will embrace that faith. And you will know when anything is contending against that faith. And you will stand. I'm looking at somebody who can stand. I said you will stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. You see, if you look at Second Chronicles uh, chapter chapter thirty-two, look at it in verse seven. In Second Chronicles chapter thirty-two, looking at verse seven, it says, "Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid, nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria." No, for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. There be more with us than with him. I didn't hear your good amen. amen. Many times we have heard, many times we have read, many times we have even preached it. Greater you see that is in you than he that is in the world. But when those people in the world, when they come near and they stand face to face with us, and now we're to preach the gospel to them, we're to share the gospel with them, and we're to enlighten them in the word of God, we forget that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We think that the one in us has gone on vacation. It's no more there. But it says it's always there. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And it's greater on the inside than anybody you see on the outside. And has given us a faith to contend for and we're going to contend and we contend triumphantly and militantly in Jesus name. Look at verse 8 there. It says in verse 8, it says with him is the arm of flesh. That him could be any enemy. Could be a king, could be a Nebuchadnezzar, could be a pharaoh, could be an herald. That him could be any enemy. That him could be a persecutor. With him, whoever he is, is an, is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. I'm going to make that personal. I'm going to say, but with me. Say it for yourself, but with me is the Lord my God to help me and to fight my battles and the people rested themselves upon the words of Ezekiah king of Judah did you overcome of course they did am I going to overcome of course I'm going to overcome are you going to overcome Yes, we are going to overcome. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it tells us, and the Lord sent an angel. In your battle, the Lord will send an angel. As you are contending for the faith, the Lord will send an angel. As you are moving on in the walk of the Lord in the day, in the night, the Lord will send an angel. When it appears your own natural strength cannot carry you, the Lord will send an angel. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off. Tell me the next word there. Which cut off. Tell me the next word there. All. It will cut them all off. All the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame. Your enemies will return with shame. 
your opposers will return with shame. And those who try to double cross your way and they want to hinder you from getting to the destiny you will get to, they will return back home with shame. And return with shame of face to his own land when he was come and when he was come into the house of his God, of his idol, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him and there they, they slew him there with the sword. Your enemies have vanished. Yeah. Number one, be strong and courageous. Number two, be strong for the commission. Number three, be strong to earnestly contend and conquer. Number four now is be strong with covenant companions. Be strong with covenant companions. We're looking at Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2 and there we're reading from verse 4. Haggai chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 4. It says, look at this, look at the companions, covenant companions that the people that that surrounded Haggai, the people that surrounded uh, this uh, man, uh, Jehoshadak, the, uh, the son of Jehoshadak, and the people that surrounded this Joshua, the people that surrounded this Zerubbabel, they were companions in the same covenant. If you're going to succeed, you're going to surround yourself with the companions that are having covenant relationship with God. Haggai chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua. That's the second one, the son of Jehozadak, and the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, says the Lord, and work. Number one, be strong. Number two, be strong. Number three, be strong and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. The power of the Lord will never leave you. Amen. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, According to the word that I covenanted with you. That's why we, we talk about them, about Joshua, about Zerubbabel, and all the people. That's why they bounded themselves together. And they were companions in the covenant. It says, According to the word that I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, fear ye not. Fear ye not. As you go back home, fear ye not. As you go to evangelize, fear ye not. As you go to preach the word of God, to take root in the lives of the people you are preaching to, fear ye not. The word of God will prosper in your mouth. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once, it's a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the dry land. And then in verse 7, it tells us, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come up. And I will fill this house, I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. In verse 8, it says, everything we need to succeed is in heaven, is with him. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And I gives us assurance in verse 9, and it says, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former the glory of your latter ministry shall be greater than that of the former and the glory of your service today and henceforth will be greater than of the former in jesus name says the lord of hosts and in this place i will give peace peace will reign in your heart peace will reign in your family peace will reign in your service peace will reign in your profession and peace will reign all around you in Jesus' name. In this place, don't run away. In this place, in this church, in this ministry, in that occupation, God will give you peace, says the Lord of hosts. He tells us then, be strong 
and you are strong with covenant companions. Number five, be strong against corruption and compromise. In First Corinthians chapter 16, First Corinthians chapter 16, we're reading from verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. When there's any tendency for, for compromise to come in, be strong. When there's any tendency for corruption to come in uh, into the local church, corruption to come in into their fellowship, corruption to come in uh, into the ministry, corruption to come in uh, all around you, anywhere you are, where you are, corruption will not have a foothold where you are compromise will not take a foothold and anywhere you are the lord has called you as a minister the lord has called you as a preacher the lord has called you an evangelist and you have to make sure that you are strong in the spirit and you are strong in the in the communion in the commission the lord has given you and he tells us very clearly that when corruption or compromise or anything that will corrode, that will destroy the standard of the word of God is to come into the place where you are, you will stand. Amen. That's why we wear the armor. That's why we put on the armor. We're not just putting on the armor for play or just to, you know, be roaming about. We do that for a purpose. And it is so that anywhere you are, anywhere I am, say anywhere I am, corruption will not have a play a foothold in that place in jesus name and compromise will not have a foothold in that place in jesus name be strong against corruption and compromise number six be stronger with commensurable consecration we're coming to ephesians chapter 6 now and we're reading from verse 10 ephesians chapter 6 we're looking at verse 10 it says finally my brethren finally children of god finally brothers and sisters finally soldiers in the army of the lord finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might this number six is to be strong with commensurable or commensurate consecration what does that mean many years ago let's say for example 20 years ago you have this limited challenge and this limited problem and you were consecrated and the consecration of that day matched the challenge of the hour and so you moved on and now 20 years have passed and you have a greater problem today a greater challenge today a different challenge today diverse kinds of problems today if you bring in the consecration of 20 years ago it's not commensurate it's not compatible it's not equal to the challenge of the day the consecration of 20 years ago or 10 years ago cannot work today you see there are people that says praise the lord i maintain my consecration i can't praise the lord for you on that you maintain your consecration the consecration of 30 years ago i'm still standing on that consecration i can tell you brothers and sisters i've not let down on my consecration i'm still as consecrated as i was 30 years ago it will not work the enemy is more clever today than 30 years ago and the challenges are more terrible than uh, 30 years ago your consecration must get up and match the challenge of today and your consecration before you were married yes i was consecrated and you had limited challenge and limited difficulty but now you are married now you have in-laws now you have the people that are questioning where do you go every saturday why are you not always at home why are you all the time you give 24 hours of every day to serve god what kind of church is that all the people that oppose you today they were not there five years ago that's why your consecration will come up to match the difficulties and the challenges of today and when it says finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might is reminding you that whatever is the challenge of today your faith will climb up to that challenge 
your power will climb up to that challenge. And your consecration will climb up to that challenge so that your strength today will match the difficulties and the situation you have today. That's why every time when we come together like this and we hear the word of God, we pray and we pray through. We pray and we pray all our hearts out. We look at the challenges we have today and we look at the situation we have today and we say, Lord, I know that the strength of even last year will not uh, match. I know Know the consecration of uh, 10 years ago will not match. Help me, Lord, to increase my consecration and to beef up my consecration so that my life today, my strength today, my courage today, my consecration today, my firmness today will get up to match the challenges I have today. For measured consecration. That's why it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. I will be strong in the Lord. I said, I will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Lord strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. Number seven, be strong in the conquering captain. The captain of our salvation, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants us to be strong in him, Christ in you and you in Christ, all your heart, all your strength, all your vision, all your focus, all your faith, everything you have in him, and he in his fullness in you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you, and it shall be done through you in Jesus' name. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 1. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 2, it tells us, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, don't subtract, the same, don't add, the same, don't alter, the same, don't cut the sharp edges, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And then he tells us in verse 3, look at verse 3, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardness, help me shout, endure hardness. Look at the person beside you and say, endure hardness. Look at the person on the other side and your hardness. Yeah. You know, there are members of our church, there are workers in our church, there are preachers in our church, there are leaders in our church that don't think there is any hardness. They think the ministry is a bed of roses. Everything will be easy, and once they meet a little son on their way, on their path, they say, I cannot go on, I cannot preach again, I cannot minister again. I say, my brother, what's happening? My sister, what's happening? They say, there's a little hardness there. I say, go through it. Don't let the person who put the hardness there be stronger than you are. And let the person know that that hardness will not stop you. The hardness will not stop me. The challenge will not stop me. You know, some people, you find they are there today, they are not there tomorrow. And then when you meet them on the way, you say, my brother, I didn't see you again. Ah, he said, times are hard. Situations are hard. I didn't know it would be like that. Didn't you know? I thought you knew. I thought you had read the word of God that said, therefore, endure hardness. Come back home and endure hardness. You know, those of us who went to school, we had difficulties. I remember some of my teachers at school, some of them were hard. And any time they were coming, and we know it was their lesson, you know, our hearts as young people will be palpitating like this, as if, you know, the whole of the sky is going to fall on us. But, you know, we went through from one, I can remember that person now, but I endured. 
I went through from two. I can remember that teacher now, and in, I endured. I went through from three, and I can remember. I can almost see their faces now, but I endured. That's why we're here today. That's why we graduated. That's why we're now walking. That's why we're now adults. You will endure. If you run every turn of the way, you'll never make any success in life. But as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a soldier in the army of the Lord, hardness is there. Difficulties are there. Challenges are there. A step at a time, a day at a time, a moment at a time, as we endure, we will cross over. I will cross over. I said, I will cross over. Be strong in the conquering captain. Our captain, the captain of our salvation, never ran away from difficulties. He pursued his goal until the very end. You will pursue until the very end in Jesus' name. Amen. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. You will overcome in Jesus' name. I will overcome in Jesus' name. You will in Jesus' name. Number one, be strong and courageous. Number two, be strong and bear and to, for the commission. Number three, be strong to honestly contend and conquer. Number four, be strong with covenant companions. Number five, be strong against corruption and compromise. Number six, be strong with commensurate uh, consecration. Number seven, be strong in the conquering captain. Let's come to point number two now. We're looking at point number two, the weapon against principalities in high places. If those principalities were in low places, every, everyone could conquer them. If those principalities were in the valley and we just throw something at them and they run away, everybody could conquer. But those principalities and powers and those challenges of our faith and those uh, difficulties that stand in the way, they're in high places. And it says we ought to be strong we ought to be courageous against those principalities in high places. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that she may be, that she may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. Against the stratagem, the strategy of the devil against the plans of the devil, against the plots of the devil, and against all the powers of the devil, against all the wisdom of the devil. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then in verse 12, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh, against blood, but against principalities and powers. We wrestle not against, uh, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against uh, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, in high places. Then Buster Tina, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day. Thank God we are here tonight. Thank God you are there tonight. You know, when the pandemic started, that was an evil day for the world. An evil day for every city in our nation. Every, every nation in our continent. Every nation in the world. And there are people that didn't know 
that we could stand. There are people that didn't know that will still continue in the faith, growing in the Lord, and still getting strong and stronger in the Lord. But see you there today means that God helped you through all that period of the evil day. The God of yesterday is the God of today. The God of today is the God of tomorrow. The God who helped us and we stood in days gone by is the same God, the great I am that I am. The ever-present one is always there. You keep on standing in Jesus' name. He says, if we're going to stand and if we're going to remain in the Lord, whatever comes and whatever goes, that we put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all having done all having done all some people don't do all some people they have unfinished projects in their lives unfinished plans in their lives they start this they confront difficulties they drop that the iron is hotter than I can handle and then they go to this, they start this new one, and as they, they strike their hand, their finger, they drop that, I cannot continue. Look at your life. Unfinished project there, unfinished plan there, unfinished building there, unfinished business there, unfinished ministry there. They do not do all, and they do not stand their own. But the Lord is calling upon us, and he says, when I give you a work to do, having done all to stand, I will stand. I said, I will stand. That's why we're looking at three things. Number one, when it says the weapon against principalities in high places. Number one, not carnal, old covenant weapons. The weapons were to use and the armor we're putting on is not the carnal weapons of the old covenant. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're looking at verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 4. It's talking about the armor that is carnal and the armor that is fleshly and the armor that the new covenant believers should not touch. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Our warfare is different from the warfare of the old covenant. It's different from the warfare of fighting the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Philistines and Goliath. Therefore, because our warfare is different, our weapon too is different. For the weapons of our, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Every stronghold in your life will be pulled down in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, casting down imaginations, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Think about the knowledge of God you have. The knowledge of his grace you have. The knowledge of his love you have. The knowledge of his power you have. Anything that stands against the knowledge of the grace, abundant grace in your life, anything that stands against the knowledge of the love of God you have, anything that stands against the knowledge of the power of the Holy Ghost you have, that will not allow you to move in that knowledge of God, will not allow you to move in that grace of God, will not allow you to move in that uh, power of God. Those are the high things a weapon, spiritual weapon, will bring them down in Jesus' name. Amen. And it says, bringing into captivity every thought to, be, to the obedience of Christ. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 26. We're looking at verse 51. Not using carnal weapons, not using the, the weapons of the old covenant. Look at this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 51. And behold, 
one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck his servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And then in verse 20, in verse 52, it says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword, even if you are trying to defend Jesus, all they that take the sword, even if you try and you are defending your shepherd, all they that take the sword, even if you are trying to defend yourself, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Those are carnal weapons. Those are the things that the people of old, the old covenant used, and they tried to overcome. For them, that was their covenant. That was their time. That's not allowed in our lives today, and we don't do anything. We can't say, David did it this way. Can I remind you of something? David was going and was running away from Saul, and he came to the high priest, and he said, can I have uh, something there from you? The Lord, uh, the king has sent me on an errand. Number one, that was a lie. Saul did not send him on an errand. And he said, because the king's business requires haste, that's why I don't have any sword with me. David, that's a lie, old covenant weapons. And then he said, can I have any sword? And uh, the man said, there's no sword here except the sword of Goliath. Ah, he said, that's good. There's none better than that. Give it to me. And there was another man watching as everything was going on. You remember his name? Doeg. And then Doeg told uh, Saul, he said, you know what the high priest did? He gave the sword to David. And Saul came and Saul said, what did you do? What he said? I'm innocent. The man came and he said he needed weapon, canal weapon. And I gave it to him. And I thought to send him because he said the king's business required haste. And so Saul said, you will die. Eventually, you know the story. Saul used Doeg and he killed all the priests, 80 of them. And killed all the people in the city of the priest. And one of them ran to meet David. And David said, I have occasioned the death of all the priests of God. That's what carnal weapons do. Even that sort of, um, of the palaces of, of the Goliath, he never used anywhere. But he got it. So, as we're fighting the battle of the Lord, don't let us use carnal weapons and the weapons of the old covenant. They'll work against us and they'll work to destroy lives rather than building up lives. So, number one, as we think about the weapon we're to use, not carnal weapons, not old covenant weapons. Number two, only Christ's new covenant weapons. Only Christ's new covenant weapons. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 6. We're looking at chapter 8 of Hebrews and we're reading from verse 6. But now I see obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant Ours is a better covenant, and the weapon of prayer is a better weapon, and the weapon of truth of scripture, when we can tell the devil and tell the demons it is written, and then the devils will flee away. When we can use the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, we have better weapons, we have better promises, and we have a better covenant which was established upon better promises. That's the new covenant the Lord has given us. That's why he itemized all the weapons were to use. Look at it now in Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 13. 
Ephesians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 13, is talking about the weapons we put on, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God that she may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. In verse 14, it tells us, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, get the truth, buy the truth, possess the truth, own the truth, stand on the truth. You know, that's very important. Even when you are going to get into trouble, or you might get into trouble, stand on the truth. Even when people will challenge you and say, how could you do that? How did you say that? How could you go that direction? I'm sorry, but the truth is, this is what happened. You know, there are times, especially when you were much younger, something was happening in our class and the teacher got angry i'm talking about secular situation preachers don't get angry leaders don't get angry mothers fathers don't get angry and then they begin to tremble with anger in our class the teacher got angry who did this who did this and you know, some of us were not even born again at that time, but we were religious. And the religiosity in our lives taught us that we must always tell the truth. And everybody kept quiet, and they'll be looking at this and looking at that. And the teacher said, tell me, who did this? And then one of us stood up and said, sir, I did. And all the students, they were relieved because somebody was bold enough to say, I did. It was years later I became born again. All those years, I was just religious. But when it comes to telling the truth, we said, this was the truth. But then, sometimes the truth caught the other way. There was a time in our, in our school, it's not just my class now, and um, some people went out without what we call exit. And so the principal took down names. In the night after we all went to bed, the principal came, militant man, great man, forceful man. He had been in the army before in the Second World War. And he said, carry that to school. And he woke us up, so and so, so and so, so and so, so and so. And I happened to be among them. And then he called them one by one into his office. And as he came, and it came to my turn, he said, you went out without exit. I said, no, sir. Then he took his stick, and that man could beat and beat me and he asked a second time you went out without exit i said no sir and he beat me again the mark is still here more than 50 years now and the place was bleeding with the bleeding he asked me again and said you went out without exit i said no sir and he beat me again i kept on saying no he kept on beating me we tell the truth that whatever the cost we say this is the truth i wasn't even born again then but i knew that the truth will prevail so he said i should go so i left about three weeks after i went back to the principal i said sir i came to tell you something i said oh william what do you have to say i said do you remember three weeks ago you called me in the dead of the night to your office. You asked me a question. He said, yes, I remember. I said, look at the mark. You beat me. I came to tell you, sir, the same thing I told you that night, I didn't go out without exit. He looked at me and said, William, I am sorry. You know, as a principal, I have to keep the school in good perspective and I have to bring everything under control and I thought you did I thought you were telling a lie I said never 
Here is the truth. I repeated the truth again. Now, I wasn't born again and I suffered for telling the truth. And now that you are born again, whatever is happening in your locality, if you cannot tell the truth and abide by the truth, the girdle of truth, that's part of the armor that anywhere you go, in your office, in your home, anywhere you tell the truth. You don't have to dramatize anything. You don't have to pretend or be hypocritical. You just live by the truth. That is the armor that keeps us going and keeps us on our feet. And then it says, having the breastplate of righteousness. And I pray that that breastplate of righteousness will never depart from you in Jesus' name. Only what Christ would say, only what Christ will do. Think about Christ. He came before those Pharisees. He came be before those members of the Sanhedrin. And he knew they arrested him because he had said he was the son of God. They hated him because he said he was the son of God. And now he was at the point of being crucified. And this was going to finalize now the whole deal. Who are you? Are you the son of God? Of course, thou says, hereafter ye shall see the son of man coming from the clouds of glory. You have heard, you have heard. What do you say? Crucify him. He is huge for the truth. And the Lord is calling upon us. If we're going to walk by the lifestyle of Christ, we must have on the, the we must have on the girt, the belt of truth, and we must have on the breastplate of righteousness. And then in verse 15 it says, and our feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace will be in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Anywhere you are, you'll be a man of peace. You'll be a woman of peace. Anywhere you are, you'll be an agent of peace. You'll be a peacemaker. Anywhere you are, you have peace in your heart and you want peace in every other heart. Only Christ's new covenant weapon, you will stand. And today you make up your mind, whatever is going to happen, and for the truth, you'll abide in the truth all the rest of your life in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the Christians all conquering Ammon. The Christians all conquering Ammon. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, above all taking the shield of faith faith is a shield and that shield will protect you from all harm and from all attack taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench how many deaths of the wicked tell me tell me how many deaths will be conquered in your life you don't have to wake up and I'm looking for, you know, somebody to help me pray. What is coordinator? Where is group coordinator? If you take the shield of faith, you will conquer, you will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked in Jesus' name. It's faith that gets us saved. It's faith that keeps us saved. It's faith that gets us sanctified. It's faith that keeps us sanctified. It's faith that gets us victory. It's a faith that keeps us in victory. It is faith that quenches, that destroys all the fiery darts of the wicked. Those darts and those arrows may be fiery. They may be dangerous, but they will not touch your life if you have faith in Christ. I said it will not touch your life. It will not destroy your life. You have the faith and the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then in verse 17 it says, and take the helmet of salvation. Don't allow any sinner to make you doubt your salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. It will protect your head. 
it will protect your mind it will protect your heart it will protect every part of you you take the helmet of salvation and you keep it on all the time we don't uh, you know remove the helmet of salvation and put it somewhere i'm going out now i'm going to the office and i put the helmet of salvation i said no the helmet of salvation should be there all the time i'm going to witness now but now all i need now is the bible in my hand your testimony must be there your salvation must be there i'm going to visit my in-laws now you keep your helmet of salvation every time anywhere you find yourself you are with your friends you are with enemies you are with opposers you are with persecutors you are any crossroad the helmet of salvation the assurance of salvation is always there it says and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god that's how jesus conquered satan when he said it is written the devil flee, uh, fled away from him and when you take that word and you say it is written satan will flee away Amen. all the agents of satan will flee away all the powers of darkness will flee away from you in jesus name and then in verse 18 it talks about praying always praying always praying always you know some people have special times of prayer maybe that is good but you need to pray always and it doesn't have to be a prayer you pray uh, putting your hands at the back and bending your head and closing your eyes you can pray anytime anywhere you know when jonah was in the whale's belly he didn't have to put his hands at the back he didn't know where his back was he didn't have to bend he said there's no chance for that in the whale's belly he didn't have to close his eyes whether he opened his eyes or closed his eyes he couldn't see anything anyway he was at the bottom of the mountain and then he went into the deep valley and there he said I must pray now and out of that whale's belly without either kneeling or standing or lying he didn't know what position he should take he just opened his heart to the Lord and he prayed and he prayed with consecration and he prayed with a vow and he said I'll fulfill my vow and when he prayed a right like that not the posture not the standing, not the leaning, not the raising of the hand, not the putting the hand at the back, not the folding up. The, that does not matter. Raise up your hand if you want to. Put your hand at the back if you want to. But that does not matter. When he prayed with all prayer and supplication, his prayer was answered. And the fish that swallowed him up vomited him on dry ground. Whatever swallowed you up will vomit you. Whatever holds you down will release you. And whatever is binding you over and over, everything, all your chains are broken in Jesus' name. When you pray with all prayer and with all supplication in the spirit, and you are watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You pray for members of the church, all saints in your district, and you hear somebody has a problem, somebody is sick, somebody is at the hospital, somebody is having critical problem, somebody is having a, you know, a financial problem, somebody is having family problem. As you pray, God will answer your prayer and think, think about it if two of us if three of us if five of us if we heard that brother so and so is having a problem and we don't gossip and we don't say have you heard have you heard as if we're jesting but we went to the lord in prayer and we say lord this brother has the challenge we say this sister has this challenge you pray i pray we pray God will deliver that person. Even if that person does not know how to pray and how to take the challenge to God, if we all, the moment we're here and we're not just talking, uh, you know, careless talk, if we pray like this uh, passage is telling us, God must answer prayer. God has answered our prayers already. We we'll come to point number three now. Point number three is a willingness to preach in hard places. A willingness to preach in hard places. 
There are hard places. And yet, we're willing to preach in those hard places. And as we preach there, the Lord will take the word out of your mouth. And the Lord will make that word fruitful and penetrate the hearts of the people in Jesus' name. When we say hard places, hard places of evangelism. When we say hard places, hard places of ministry at places of preaching number one there are hardened people hardened people but don't look at their faces the lord told ezekiel he said the people are hardened all the same i'm sending you to them and as you get to them the word of god will penetrate have you found people like that in your zone have you found them in your district have you found them in your region have you found them in your state and say, what am I going to do? These are people that are hardened. The Lord will use the word, the sword of the spirit in your mouth. It will cut them down to their knees. They will believe the Lord and they'll be convicted. They'll be converted in Jesus' name. Number two, number two, there are people that are haughty princes, haughty princes. Here comes uh, Daniel. And as Daniel came, uh, he saw this uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel, are you able to interpret my dream? I had this dream like this, dream like this. And you know, the Lord called and the Lord showed uh, Daniel the interpretation of that dream. Uh, and he said, oh, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the man. Here is the condition of what uh, you know you go through. You will be dreaming to the forest and you will eat grass like animal. When the Lord has given us the word before a haughty prince, don't minimize the word. Don't edit the word. Don't tone down the word. How can I say this to King Nebuchadnezzar? Say it anyhow. And eventually Nebuchadnezzar got that message and he went uh, to the forest and he ate grass like animal. And then eventually he came back and then he now testified. He said, those that walk in pride, the Lord is able to abase. That was a hard praise, a haughty praise. But the Lord used Daniel, the Lord will use you. Yeah. And you know, and sometimes when we have, uh, you know, ministry to highly pleased people, that's hard place, hard place. But you know, we don't tell the truth like Daniel told the truth. We turn it down. We say the Lord will bless all your ministry and you will experience all the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28. As you go out, you'll be blessed. As you come in, you'll be blessed. Talk about their corruption. Talk about their cruelty. Talk about their love of money. Talk about all the evil they're doing talk about the need to repent that's what Daniel did and eventually the word prospered in his mouth number three there are hard hearted parishioners parishioners are people they go to church but they are hard hearted and they are the people that ate the multiplied bread of Jesus they are the people that uh, drank all his water they are the people that ate his multiplied the food and then eventually they said crucify him crucify him and Peter rose up and he said you crucified the prince of glory the lord of glory and Pilate would have released him but you said crucify him and then he pointed at them he said now Jesus Christ that you crucified is risen from the dead and they were broken down they said what shall we do he told them repent and 3,000 of them repented they were hard hearted parishioners but all the same the Lord turned them around as we go to them the Lord will turn them around but you know, if you are money, you know, if you stay there in your district, if you stay there in your region, if you stay there in your state, and instead of uh, going to those hard people and the haughty people and the hard hearted parishioners, instead of going to those villages, you know, you are sitting down there. What did I do? 
that the GS sent me to a place like this? What did I do that the state of Asia sent me to a place like this? All these people are hard. They are idol worshippers and they are not going to listen to any word at all. I'm preaching to them like this. I read from Genesis to Revelation and they just be looking at you like this. I pray they cannot, they don't know how to say amen. Why am I here? If you are like that, nobody will be converted. But if you say praise the Lord, the Lord has seen that I am able. Somebody say, I am able. I am capable. Somebody say, I'm capable. I am available. Somebody say, I'm available. The Lord sees that I'm able, I'm capable, I'm available, and He has sent me here. And even though they are hard, I have the willingness to minister in hard places. All those hard hearts will be converted in Jesus' name. Amen. Number four, there are hateful persecutors. Hateful persecutors. Remember Saul of Tarsus? And the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the priest. He said, what shall I do, Lord? He was broken down. There are people like uh, persecutors, Saul, persecutors, all, they're all there. And yet when the Lord has sent you to them, uh, like he told Ananas, Ananas, get up. I'm sending you to the house of Judas. And you'll ask for one man. His name is Saul of Tarsus. And he's praying now. And Ananas said, oh Lord, how can I do that? I know about Saul. He came to this city to arrest anybody that calls upon your name. And Jesus said, go, because I've arrested him. And then he got there and he said, brother Saul, brother Saul, the Lord who appeared unto you in the way has sent me unto you. Had man, had inch man, had persecutor, he has sent me unto you that you receive your sight and you receive the Holy Ghost and the man received his sight and the man received the Holy Ghost and he received a ministry God can make a Paul out of those persecutors in Jesus name and there are halting prodigals halting prodigals here Elijah came to them after three years of famine and he said uh, Ahab get all the people together and then when they came together he said how long halt ye between two opinions if God be God serve him if Baal serve him and they could not speak a single word and then he said we're going to have a contest of the gods the God that answers by fire let him be that God they said you are spoken well he got all those prophets of Baal he said call upon your God of fire and if your God can bring down fire then the nation can continue worshiping the God of Baal and then they prayed day and night and they prayed and they caught themselves until blood was gushing out and then he came to them and said maybe you have not shouted enough pray harder and maybe he's asleep, then you can wake him up. Maybe he's on a journey, you need to recall him because this is a day of contest. After they have done everything, but then there was no answer from heaven and there was no fire coming from anywhere. Then he said, get aside and you repair the altar of the Lord. The Lord will use you to repair the altar. And then after I repaired the altar at the time of the evening sacrifice, he said they should pour water around the trench, four barrels they did, and then four barrels again they did, and four barrels again they did. The whole place was wet with water. And then he looked up to God, he said, God, O oh God of Abraham and God of Isaac and God of Jacob, let these people know that you have called them back again to yourself. And before you finish the prayer tell me what happened fire came down from heaven and all those people halting prodigals all those people bowed their faces before the Lord and they said the Lord is God the Lord is God the Lord himself will use us so that the word of God in our mouth will bring fire to melt the hearts of the people in Jesus name 
but you know there are helpless pleasure seekers helpless pleasure seekers yet yeah, solomon was telling us he said in ecclesiastes chapter 2 reading from verse 1 he said i i, I wanted to try everything men singers women singers wine women everything he said but all this i found to be vanity and then he said that last year what the preacher is saying we're looking for we're looking at those pleasure seekers in town and all they want is merry all they want is dancing, all they want is pop house, all they want is their nightclub. But we're supposed to go to all of them and preach the gospel to all of them. Those are the hard people. Those are the hard places. And as we reach out with them, to them with the word of God, the Lord will convert them. The Lord will change their hearts. We're not saying, no, I cannot reach that one. All that they're looking for is pleasure. All they're looking for is the flesh. All they're looking for is wine. All they're looking for is this and that. Those are the hard people in the hard places. And the Lord has sent us to them. And we're going to reach them in Jesus' name. Amen. There are heathen philosophers. Heathen philosophers. Paul the Apostle came across them and he said what will this babbler say and then he spoke to them and he climbed down from their height of philosophy and he said God now has commanded all men everywhere to repent and they turned to the Lord many of them and they knew the Lord and as those philosophers in every tower of learning as we confront them with the word of God they'll come down from the ivory tower. Don't say, I don't know what to say. Just say the word of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life and the Lord will bring conviction in their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. There are horrible persons, horrible persons. Why do we say that? Jesus said, I send you forth a sheep to the lambs, to the wolves. Those wolves are the horrible people. They're horrible and they're terrible and they're dangerous and destructive. And yet God knew that. Jesus knew that. And yet he said, I'm sending you to those wolves. They will not eat you up. Those lions will not eat you up. Those dangerous bears will not eat you up. And those dangerous, damnable people will not eat you up in Jesus' name. Anywhere in the city, everywhere in the city, anywhere in the region, everywhere in the region, anywhere in the, in the state, everywhere in the state, the Lord has called us, whether it's a shrine or idol worship, a forest or wherever, we're going as an army of the Lord and we're going to conquer every opposition to the gospel in Jesus' name. And when Jesus sent them as sheep, as lambs, in the midst of the world, they came back and they reported and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus said, yes, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And he said, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and to tread on scorpions and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Will tread on all the serpents. Will tread on all the scorpions. And no power will be able to hurt us in Jesus' name. Don't be afraid then of those hard places and don't say, why am I in this district? Why am I in this group? Why am I in this region? Why am I in this state? You are there to stand for God and to stand for the truth and to preach the gospel and the gospel will penetrate all their hearts in Jesus' name. There are hurting peasants, hurting peasants. What do we mean by hurting peasant? Jesus saw them and they were like scattered sheep without any shepherd and they were fainting and they were drooping and they were almost, uh, you know, falling down because they hurt and there was nobody to remove or to kill their hurt. And as we meet people on the street and everywhere and they're hurting 
and they are tired and they are fainting and they are weary and it appears they might even die the next day we bring the message of life and the gospel to them and as we bring the gospel to them they will revive they will be born again and they will come and they will know the Lord in Jesus name there are hypocritical priests and prophets hypocritical priests and prophets they say they are priests they say they are preachers they are even prophesying this and that and the Lord said they are hypocritical but you know in Acts chapter 6 verse 7 it says that the word of God multiplied greatly and many of those priests hypocritical, hypocritical priests they were converted to the faith the Lord will convert them in Jesus name and there are harmful pastors and preachers and full pastors and preachers they tell their people you must stay here in darkness you must stay here in, in superstition you must stay here in deceit you must stay here in falsehood if you ever go out of this place then they put a curse on them and while you go to them they are afraid you know i cannot live where i am i know there's darkness there i know there's evil there they made us take a covenant that if you ever reveal the blood covenant we did here if you ever tell anybody all those gospelers that are coming to you here is the curse that will come upon you you tell them that is nothing everybody i said that is nothing you break that curse you break that covenant you remove them away from that prison where they are and the Lord will make the word of the gospel penetrate in their hearts in Jesus name there are hedged in prisoners hedged in prisoners they are imprisoned in their synagogue they are imprisoned in their sanctuary they are imprisoned in their temple and they tell them they threaten them anyone that goes out of this place will never do well anyone that goes out of this place this is the harm this is the havoc that will happen to him uh, that's like that man in john chapter 9 and then jesus met him and then he opened his blind eyes your blind eyes are open Amen. all the darkness is taken away and then uh, he came back seeing uh, and he said that's the blind man he's now seeing and that said no he's not the blind man that's not him it's just like him he said i am he he gave a testimony and he said how did your eyes get open he said jesus made clay and he put on my eyes and then i came seeing uh, then they brought him to the pharisees and the pharisees said is it true were you blind before how, how is it now you're seeing? He said, it's Jesus. Somebody tell me, it's Jesus. Jesus. Who saved you? Jesus. Who healed you? Jesus. Who opened your eyes? Jesus. Who is going to open the eyes of other people? Jesus. It's Jesus. They said, they didn't believe. They called his parents and they said, is this your child? They said, yes. Was he born blind? They said, yes. How then did he see? They were afraid. Parents are afraid, but the son not afraid. I am not afraid. I said I am not afraid. They said he's of age, ask him. So they asked him again. They said, how did your eyes get open? He said, I told you before. And you're asking me again, do you want to be his disciple? I love that. They said, you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. They said, we know that man is a sinner. He said, what? Since the world began, I never heard that a sinner opened the eyes of a blind man. And this man opened my eyes. They said, what do you see of him? He said, he's a prophet. It's better than you. You couldn't open my eyes. He opened my eyes. I come to introduce him to you. And he drove him out of the synagogue. In any case, the synagogue was useless when, he, when the people were there. Driving you out of where you will not make heaven if you stayed there. I think that's all right. I said, I think that's all right. 
you're not the first person to be driven out. I will not be the last person to be driven out. They're still driving them out. But all those places they drive them out from, they cannot add anything to their lives. And Jesus met him and he said, do you believe in the Son of God? He said, who is the Son of God? I want to believe. He said, he it is that speaks unto you. He said, with all my heart, Lord, I believe. His eyes were open, his soul was saved. But you know, there are people like him who are still hedged in prisoners in all those synagogues, in all those churches, in all those denominations. The Lord is sending you out to them. Bring them out. I said, bring them out and compel them to come out and to come into the kingdom. God will use you. Amen. As God is using me, God will use you. Amen. God will use me more, God will use you more. Amen. Let there be willingness in your heart to go everywhere, hard places, difficult places. Lord, I'm ready. Lord, we're ready. We're going to go. I will preach the gospel. And many souls will come to know the Lord in Jesus' name. Are you ready? The Lord is asking a question. Who will go for us? Who will go for him? Here am I, Lord send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Rise up and tell the Lord, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Don't be afraid of the hard places. Don't be afraid of the haughty people. Don't be afraid of the dangerous people. Don't be afraid of the difficult areas. The Lord is calling you. Answer the Lord. Here am I, Lord. Send me.